Hit the subscribe button or visit us at auau.auanet.org. Good evening, and welcome to the Surgical Management of BPH course. We strive to offer outstanding educational courses and greatly appreciate your evaluations and general feedback so that we are able to continuously improve our programs. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. Thank you to the course director, Dr. Stephen Kaplan, for planning an excellent education course. We thank you for your dedication and commitment to uro urologic education. Thank you as well to our faculty for their time, talent, and expertise in developing today's program. Please stay tuned for a keyword that, we, that will be provided during the activity. The keyword is used to verify your participation in the activity. You will need to use this keyword to access the course evaluation, CME credit claim, and certificate. Please engage in today's program by submitting questions addressed to our expert faculty. Questions should be submitted through the Q&A box in your Zoom window. All questions will be administered at the end of the program. We hope that you will actively participate as you connect and learn from each other during the course. Due to the size of the audience, all participants will be in listen-only mode without video, but we encourage you to ask questions at any time through the Q&A pane and communicate with one another through the chat box in Zoom. The AUA is accredited by the ACCME and designates this activity for a maximum of two AMA PRA category run credits. Valuations are very important to us. Course evaluations and CME credit will be administered electronically on AUA University immediately following the live program today. As the AUA continues to develop virtual education that meets your needs, we welcome your feedback regarding both the content and format of this activity. Please visit auau.auanet.org to complete your evaluations and credit claim. All persons in a position to control the content of an AUA educational activity are required to disclose any relevant financial relationships with any commercial interest. Please visit AUA University to view Faculty Education Council and COI Review Worker Disclosures. The AUA would like to thank Olympus Corporation of the Americas and Teleflex for providing independent educational grants in support of this activity. This activity is meant to be educational in nature and in some instances reflects the opinion of the presenters. The information does not guarantee accuracy of claims submitted. Please verify the accuracy of individual medical claims submitted and please follow individual insurer's rules. It is my pleasure to introduce our course director, Dr. Stephen Kaplan. Dr. Kaplan is director of the men's wellness program at Mount Sinai Health System and professor of ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. He is an internationally renowned authority and one of the primary thought leaders in the study of benign diseases, the association of metabolic factors with voiding dysfunction and female urology with symptoms related to both benign prostate enlargement and bladder function. Dr. Kaplan is also the AUA's chair of urologic research. I will now turn the program over to Dr. Kaplan who will lead us in our knowledge assessment. Uh, thank you, Kaylee, and thank you to all of you who are participating, and thank you to my faculty uh, who have done an amazing amount of work, and uh, as you'll enjoy during this conversation, I'll learn a lot from them on the surgical management of BPH. Um, before we begin today's virtual course on the surgical management of BPH, please participate in this brief knowledge assessment. At the close of today's discussion, we will have a follow-up assessment using these same questions. The results of these assessments help the AUA measure the educational effectiveness of this live educational activity and aid in the successful planning and development of future activities. Can we have the first question, please? Well, I guess that'll be the second question. <laughs> Six, uh, there we go, thank you. A 52-year-old male presents with BPH with a prostate volume of 60 cc's. Given his age, he is concerned about reoperation rates and receiving general anesthesia. Which BPH treatment would you recommend based upon its pivotal study and low reoperation rates? Prostatic urethral lift, convective water vapor therapy, prostatic arterial embolization, or bipolar terp? Everyone take a moment to submit your answer. <laughs> 
Looks like a little over 50% is voted. We'll give everyone a couple more seconds. Okay, we'll move on to the next question. We can get the second question, please. A 67-year-old male receives a cardiac stent and must stay on anticoagulation therapy for the next six months. He's in urinary retention with a 90 cc prostate volume. Which prostate surgery is recommended for high-risk patients on blood thinners? Open simple prostatectomy, high-pressure saline hydrodistension, thulium laser nucleation, and bipolar TURP. Everyone take a moment to submit your response, please. Few more seconds, everybody. Okay, we're gonna close this poll, move on to the next question. A 67 year old male is considering operative management of his lower urinary tract symptoms due to BPH. Which of the following treatments is not recommended outside of the clinical trial setting? robotic simple prostatectomy, prostatic urethral lift, convective water vapor ablation, or prostate arterial embolization. Everyone go ahead and submit your response, please. A few more seconds, everybody. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and close this one and move on to the next question. And finally, this is a 58 year old male who presents with BPH and a prostate volume of 40 cc's, but desires uh, to preserve his erectile and ejaculatory function. According to the AUA clinical guidelines, which two surgical therapies should he consider, should he consider to achieve this goal? TUMT and prostatic urethral lift, prostatic urethral lift and transurethral incision of the prostate, transurethral incision of the prostate and water vapor thermal therapy, or prostatic urethral lift and water vapor thermal therapy. Go ahead and take a moment to respond. A few more seconds, everybody. Okay, we're gonna move on to the final question. Okay, I think those were all the uh, four yeah. questions. That was. Okay, and we'll be asking again these questions at the end of the uh, course, and hopefully uh, the assessment will demonstrate that uh, you learned something from the course. So you all got to do better uh, after the end of the course. So I'll take this, we can come back and do this again. So let's talk about the activity goals uh, for tonight. We want to update urologists and the urologic care team on the latest advancements in the surgical management of BPH and utilize the AUA clinical guidelines as an effective evidence-based reference which discusses patient presentation, diagnosis, treatment, and follow-up of patients based on the currently available data. Next slide. Okay, today's course will explore new technologies that are available for the surgical treatment of DPH. And while we may refer to the various procedures by their clinically known names, all discussions and recommendations are based upon improving patient care. More specifically, the learning objectives for tonight is at the conclusion of this activity, participants will be able to describe the role of the AUA clinical guidelines for the surgical management of BPH, discuss the evidence base for current technologies, including pivotal studies, 
and then be able to define the roles and clinical expectation of each of them. We want to interpret the current clinical results and compare the patient experiences of these treatments in relation to more established and even abandoned therapies for patient groups with similar characteristics. And we'll discuss some of that with my faculty and differentiate between each of the new technologies for treating BPH LUTs based on both their mode of action and the quality of supporting evidence. So with that, I want to uh, introduce uh, my outstanding faculty. Uh, there are three excellence on the subject matter and they are uh, Dean Elterman. Uh, Dean is an Associate Professor of Urology at the University of Toronto and an attending urologist at the University Health Network in downtown Toronto. Dean completed his fellowship in functional urology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Center, Cancer Center at New York Presbyterian Hospital while Cornell Medical College. I'm proud to say he was one of my uh, fellows and he's done amazing work uh, since then. He also completed his master's degree in clinical epidemiology and health services research at Weill Cornell Graduate School of Medical Sciences. His clinical and research interest includes men's health, novel technologies for BPH, and overactive bladder. Uh, Dr. Brian Mazzarella is the Director of Clinical Research at Urology Austin and holds an appointment as an affiliate faculty member at the Dell Medical School. He practices in all areas of general urology, treating both benign and malignant disease. His particular specialization within his practice involves BPH and emerging technology in the field of male voiding dysfunction. Dr. Mazzarella has served as principal investigator on many clinical trials in nearly all subspecialties of urology. He has also traveled extensively to teach surgical techniques to his colleagues. And finally, uh, Dr. Michael Polisi, uh, who's one of my colleagues and a, and a great friend. Uh, he's the chair of the Department of Urology at Mount Sinai Downtown Union Square and professor of the Department of Urology at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. He's also the director of minimally invasive surgery of the Mount Sinai Health System and he specializes in robotic, laparoscopic, and endoscopic surgery. He specializes in the diagnosis and treatment of kidney, ureteral, adrenal, bladder, and prostate disease with a special emphasis on robotic surgeries relating to kidney cancer. So with that, we are going to now open the floor to uh, utilize case scenarios that will explore the AUA's BPH clinical guidelines and their use in clinical practice. Let me just make sure my faculty is all here and they are, so thank you for participating. Uh, so let's go to our first case. And again, we're going to go to various clinical scenarios and get some opinions about this. So let's go with our first case. As part of our discussion, please identify which surgical therapy you would select for the patient and why, as well as any pivotal studies and guideline protocols that led to this determination. So if we can have that first case, thank you. So this is a 55 year old male who presents with a long history of bothersome lower urinary tract symptoms. He's got an IPSS of 18 and a bother score of four, but has failed behavioral and plant extract therapy. He's sexually active and ejaculation is very important to him. On transrectal ultrasound, his prostate measures 50, 50 grams and has bilobal hypertrophy. So for this first case, let's start with Dr. Elterman. Uh, what would you recommend and why? Well, I think, uh, first of all, thank you to the AUA and uh, Steve for this uh, great program. Uh, for this gentleman, he's young, he's sexually active, and he wants to maintain ejaculation. And so uh, he's really exhausted. Uh, his, it looks like his medical therapies, and as we know, the medical therapies result uh, in ejaculatory dysfunction, particularly the alpha blockers. He'd be a very good candidate for a minimally invasive uh, surgical therapy. The AUA guidelines do recommend both uh, the prostatic urethral lift or Urolift, as well as the uh, convective water vapor ablation or Resume. Both of these are on the guidelines and they've been shown to have uh, no significant change to ejaculatory function. Of course, no change to erectile function. And then of course, we now have the uh, ITINT, the temporary implantable nitinol device, which is a new office-based minimally invasive therapy, which also does not change uh, erectile or ejaculatory function. So I think with those three, it's really going to improve his symptoms without necessarily having to sacrifice ejaculation. Of course, there are other few surgical options, like if you had a middle lobe, you could do a middle lobe only resection. And of course, aquablation, which is the new water jet ablation, has a very low rate of retrograde ejaculation, around 8% or so. Uh, 
Okay, so Dean, you've given some of the overall data. Are there any pivotal studies regarding patient outcomes here that you'd like to share? Some for lo lo uh, longer data. We know the pivotal studies and the longer data. Can you share some of that with the uh, our audience? Yeah, so the both the pivotal study for the prostatic urethral lift, which was the, uh, the, the pull study was the lift study, uh, has uh, gone out now to five years and again showed no changes in the uh, ejaculatory function scores. Same is true for the uh, pivotal study for Resume, which was the Resume 2 study, again published in the Journal of Urology in April, uh, followed out for five years and again no changes in erectile or ejaculatory function. Uh, the aquablation, the most recent uh, paper was in the open water study, which was an all comer uh, registry study. And again, that was the one uh, after a year showed uh, very low rates of erectile and ejaculatory dysfunction, 8%. And then the ITIN studies have just been published and uh, we will actually be putting out the sexual function. Uh, but in the gold journal, they showed again, no changes to erections or ejaculation. So essentially all the pivotal studies for all of these minimally invasive treatments have shown very uh, good outcomes with regard to sexual and ejaculatory function. Uh, so just, just for the audience uh, to remember that uh, while we'll be discussing potential therapies and actually potential even new therapies that you may not even heard about because we all want you to know at least what's coming down the pike. In terms of the AUA clinical guidelines, there, there were no real comments made yet about the ITIN device simply because at the time that this was written, uh, that data was not there. So while it's out there, uh, certainly in the United States and uh, and it's available in Canada as well. Uh, yeah, it is. It's, it's, a, it's available now in many, many countries around the world. Okay. There's no clinical guideline statements that we made either this past year or in the upcoming guidelines that will be presented in Las Vegas. So just uh, everybody should just understand that. So Brian, what are your thoughts? I mean, broadly, I absolutely echo everything Dean said in terms of the options. You know, I, I think... Um, we're very fortunate for this patient that we've entered an era of um, minimally invasive treatment options that give this patient a lot of opportunities to treat his BPH and still preserve his sexual function. I think the thought that I would add is that, um, you know, the importance of having this transrectal ultrasound for this patient that told us that his prostate was 50 grams, uh, it really significantly guided the recommendations that Dean was able to speak about. I think, you know, as you look at the spectrum of all the BPH options, uh, if you had not had that bit of information, you would have been unsure what the efficacy of medications were gonna be, unsure on how to guide the patient or counsel them specifically on their response to minimally invasive treatments, whether they would even be a candidate for minimally invasive treatments and unsure of whether or not you needed to expose them to some risks that come with some of the other treatment options. And so I, I think that the uh, other point that I would just add to this discussion is that that really, I think, was helpful in terms of um, guiding our treatment for this patient. Okay. And Mike, your thoughts? Yeah. So along those same lines, I, I just want to extend that. I, I probably would even go further and say that even a prostate MRI may not be a bad idea in this type of case for a younger gentleman uh, who we're considering doing procedure on. Uh, obviously, we want to worry about prostate cancer as well, and, and we want to make sure that he's properly screened, um, and that will also give us a sort of a better guideline as to how to actually approach a case like this. Uh, if it's truly 50 grams, as we know, transrectal ultrasounds are not uh, are basically uh, something that don't don't really uh, travel well from from physician to physician. Meaning, we, we see differences, wide differences between uh, different practices, and so I think an MRI certainly can can help uh, guide us uh, for some, a lot of these treatments going forward. Okay, so what's interesting as we listen to this discussion here, we, we jump to minimally invasive therapies, uh, talk a little about surgery. Does anybody believe in using medical therapy anymore? Or are we just jump right to minimally invasive surgery? So uh, Dean, since you started the conversation, uh, where does medical therapy fit with a patient like this? You know, I think as part of the discussion you're going to have, uh, he has to his credit tried behavioral therapy and plant extract for what it's worth. Um, he may be interested and averse, in fact, to having, um, he may not want to have a minimally invasive treatment. And in fact, you could add, uh, say, Tadalafil, five milligrams, which may help with his BPH LUTs, but not impact his ejaculation, as you would see with an alpha blocker. So that's something you could certainly raise. Uh, but that being said, he's quite bothered. Uh, we see very minimal improvements relative to some of the myths in surgery. So you're looking at maybe a two to three point improvement in IPSS with medical therapy, uh, much greater improvements with the minimally invasive and surgical therapies. So it's really up to him at 55 if he wants to start taking pills daily indefinitely. 
Okay, so let's jump now to a little variable I put on the case. Same thing as before, but he has predominant urgency and a significant middle low. So Brian, does that change your approach? And the short answer is absolutely it changes my approach. I, I mean, let's um, maybe work through this in sort of the same systematic fashion it speaks about there. So, you know, to, to talk first about medical therapy, I mean, alpha blockers are of course an option for this patient, but as is noted, he's very uh, concerned about the impact on ejaculatory function. And so that could certainly impair his ejaculatory function. Uh, five ARIs, we all know, also have their own set of sexual impact. And so that's probably not an excellent uh, medical option for this patient. And we have this ultrasound piece of information and 50 grams is sort of on the borderline of what a five ARI would even respond to. And so it's probably not an optimal option for him. I think that the Tadalafil that Dean mentioned in the last case would be a good option potentially for this patient, um, help treat their LUTs and maintain their sexual function. You know, the other change you just gave me in the prompt here is that this patient has predominantly urgency. And I, I do think that that's worth noting. I think that's part of the value of why the AUA guidelines um, are fairly specific about obtaining an AUA symptom score for patients like this, because that helps you really to understand not an aggregate of what their overall symptom score is, but sort of tease out these storage and voiding symptoms for these patients. And so I, I would be willing also to try uh, either an anticholinergic or a beta agonist like Mirabegron for this patient. Uh, I think it's reasonable uh, in terms of improving his symptoms. It does raise a different question, which is if that's the path we're heading, you know, there's the possibility that this patient has primary OAB, although I think somewhat more likely is that they have secondary OAB caused by their bladder outlet issues. And so while I'd be willing to try the uh, anticholinergic, it would also potentially make me want to at least consider uh, bladder outlet treatment for this patient. Okay. Um, I think we could move beyond medications uh, as an option for this patient. And one of the important statements I think that exists in the current AUA guidelines is guideline statement seven, which basically says broadly which patients um, are candidates for surgical therapy. And it says patients that are refractory to medications, but also those that are unwilling to take the risks that come with medications. And I think that's a pretty impactful statement uh, in that, you know, while I think medication conversations are absolutely germane for this patient, it's not, in my opinion, absolutely mandatory that he be, you know, a failure to these medications or refractory before we move on uh, with that conversation. It, so, uh, please. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. So in sort of speaking about the, the surgical options that exist for this patient, um, I am again happy to um, have had this uh, good measurement in terms of 50 grams be a transrectal ultrasound. I presume I also did a cystoscopy in terms of my evaluation of this middle lobe. And that's again consistent with, I think, a very important guideline statement. And I'm paraphrasing a little bit. It's guideline statement number seven that says something to the effect of clinicians should consider um, anatomic assessment of patients, whether it's via ultrasound, cystoscopy, or cross-sectional imaging. And, you know, this information was tremendously impactful again in this case because this middle lobe presence is both going to guide my surgical approach, but honestly, it also guided my medical approach. With this information in hand, I'm much more skeptical that he's going to respond to something like a Flomax or a 5-ARI. I'm probably a step more nervous about maintaining this patient long term on OAB medications. And so I do think it's worthwhile to move in the direction of considering minimally invasive therapies for this patient. Uh, as we look at the sort of different elements of this case uh, in minimally invasive therapies, prostate is 50 grams. That's squarely in the size option, both for prostatic urethral lift uh, and for water vapor thermal therapy. So those patients would have either of those options based on that. This patient cares about sexual function, and um, there are only two uh, surgical options in the guidelines that are specifically endorsed uh, to maintain sexual function for patients. And so again, that's prostatic urethral lift and water vapor thermal therapy. So those two remain uh, good options for that patient. The deciding factor to some extent comes down with the presence of this middle lobe for this patient. And um, with prostatic urethral lift, the AUA guideline statement says specifically that it is only indicated in the verified absence of an obstructing middle lobe. And so based on the guideline statements, that would indicate that this patient's probably an excellent candidate for water vapor thermal therapy as they meet all of those criteria. Uh, 
I will say, and I'm going to share with you in a little bit, that there is some data that's outside the guidelines that does endorse Eurolift's um, prostatic urethral lifts option to treat an obstructing middle lobe. Uh, and so, you know, I think that that preserves sexual function. I'll show you that data. Um, but again, that is not reflected in the AUA guidelines because the AUA guidelines did not consider that it was not a randomized controlled trial. And so it doesn't meet their sort of standard of treatment options. And the last one I would mention is surgical treatments. And based on all of these anatomy elements, the patient would be an excellent candidate for really almost anything that falls under the surgical treatment option, uh, whether that's conventional TURP or PVP. Um, I would also echo what Dean mentioned a moment ago, which is um, aqua ablation, water uh, convective, sorry, the other terms are so difficult. High pressure saline hydro dissection, I believe is what we've assigned to that one. Um, you know, does carry a much lower risk of sexual impact than really any of the other procedures that um, produce that conventional cavity. I believe as he said, only 8%. And so if we wanted to consider a more aggressive surgical option, I think that would probably be the most sensible one. So that's great, and Brian, that was a tremendous uh, review and, and thank you. Um, so Mike, you, uh, both of us do a lot of Eurolift and Resume. So with this patient he's presenting to you, what would be your preference if you were gonna do a minimally invasive procedure in this particular scenario? Well, obviously uh, re the Resume or conductive water vapor therapy, I think is, uh, as Brian had mentioned, is, is probably number one in that list of, uh, especially if you wanna stay within the AUA guidelines. Um, we know from the pivotal trials that uh, performing uh, procedure or doing the conductive water therapy on the median lobe uh, drops IPSS scores up to three points or more. And so no question, this is the type of uh, patient that probably would benefit from that type of approach. It's not to say that you can't do a prosthetic urethral lift. Uh, there are techniques to move the median lobe out of the way, especially depending on what size it is. Uh, you can tack it down. And in fact, there's some, uh, some of the newer, uh, some of the newer um, uh, models that have come out now have a device that allows you to kind of stack or push down the median lobe as well. Uh, this is also kind of an exciting, uh, exciting new development because we will be able to kind of uh, group this in together. Again, we need to be waiting for this, the, the right studies to know for sure that these are, uh, there's the longevity behind this, but uh, certainly I think both of these uh, procedures are great options for this patient. Okay, so I'm going to put, and before I ask uh, the three, I'll put you on the spot a second. Uh, Dean, you've had probably more experience than any of us with the ITIN device. Is this an ITINable patient? Uh, generally, no. Um, you want the ITIN. It'll work best for, for with a small median lobe or no median lobe. So in a significant median lobe like this, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily recommend uh, an ITIN. You need it to sort of sit over uh, the top of the bladder neck and so that anchoring leaflet sits between the bladder neck and the viru. I would just make two quick points. Uh, number one, uh, counseling this patient, if he does have a lot of pre-existing urgency, he may already be developing some detrusor overactivity and you really should address the bladder outlet. Uh, it could be this significant middle lobe causing the bladder outlet obstruction and a good proportion of men will improve their stored symptoms after you address the bladder outlet, but many will not. And so if he's really bothered by urgency and I guess nocturia, nighttime urgency, you have to counsel him that it may or may not improve given that it is already a predominant symptom and he may already be going down the road of, of irreversible detrusor overactivity and, and changes to his bladder. Okay, uh, quick question um, that was uh, by one of our audience about using an anti-muscarinic versus a beta-3 issues of retention. Are you worried about one class versus another, uh, Dean? I generally tend to prefer the, the beta-3 uh, in men just because it doesn't impact the bladder's ability to contract. That being said, the real contemporary anti-muscarinic medications that are available have been studied in men and their rates of urinary retention are very low, almost similar to placebo, in fact, single digits. And, and Steve, you've done some of those studies. So, uh, you know, things like fesoteridine or solafenacin, uh, I don't have too much concern in a man who... Um, Again, if he's emptying his bladder and we would want to have a post void, if his post voids are relatively low, he doesn't have a big risk of going into retention. Right. Yeah, and we did also the match study, the plus study, excuse me, where essentially we added uh, Mirbetric or Mirbegron to Tamsulosin, a similar study with Fibregron, just that everybody should be aware they're now two beta three agonists and the rates of urinary retention seem to be a little bit less, but essentially the rates of retention seem to be uh, fairly similar.
Um, so I guess it's going to be medication that can be used. Although I think both your points are excellent. And that is in a patient, you may want to take care of the bladder outlet obstruction, particularly if they have a significant middle lobe. Uh, and then postoperatively, they may need some type of medication for their bladder. I think it's an excellent point. So let me put you on the spot in the next minute, and then we'll jump to our last two cases. And that is, uh, there are people out there in the community, they don't have access to everything. They got to make a choice. They got to buy something. And they want to be involved with minimally invasive therapy. And they can buy one technology for minimally invasive uh, approach. And they're coming to you and they say, Doc, which one I should, uh, I should buy? So I'll start. Uh, Brian, what would you recommend to them? They, they can only buy one. Well, I mean, I, I think... <laughs> Not to go too far down the financial part of it, but you know, there's an element to uh, water vapor thermal therapy has a higher upfront uh, investment. Uh, prostatic urethral lift is higher on a per case basis, and so there are some differences in terms of those uh, those two options if you're considering the finances for all of those things. I mean, I, I tend towards thinking uh, that prostatic urethral lift is my choice among those two, and happy to uh, be upfront about that. Um, but I mean, in the end, you know, I, I think that there are so many similarities that quite frankly, my comment, Steve, is that I am happy that they are choosing to um, consider minimally invasive BPH. I think that it is altering the kind of paradigm by which we treat uh, BPH patients. I think it's changing the discussion about the right timing for intervention for these patients. And quite frankly, if they're following all of those things, uh, it doesn't much matter to me which one people select in the far end. I think the patients are benefiting greatly throughout the entire stream, regardless of whether they end up with a, a you know, Eurolift or a resume at the far end of the treatment. I think that you are a very good politician and I will vote for you when you run for, uh, for some political <laughs> office. Very well done. Dean, you have a choice of one that you're going to recommend. Which would you recommend people get involved with? I think if you're talking about minimally invasive surgical therapies alone, uh, I tend to go with Resume, the water vapor uh, therapy, only because you're not really bound by middle lobe. You have a greater uh, range of prostate volumes and anatomies that you can treat. Uh, it really does ablate the tissue and open it up. Uh, and so I would tend to go for mists. I would go with resume because of its versatility. And in terms of just the broad spectrum, I would probably say aquablation, because again, you can really treat everything from the small end 30 all the way up to the 300 gram prostates. Okay. And Mike, your thoughts? I'm a, I'm a little biased since I'm here talking about uh, convective water therapy, so <laughs> thermal therapy. And obviously we do a lot of that. Uh, in the so, you, so you'll do the PUL, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we'll do the PUL. Um, no, I, I think in terms of versatility and the ability to really take care of patients in all, all different shapes and sizes, the anatomically, uh, with whether there's a median lobe there or not, uh, we're going to talk a little bit uh, in, in a second uh, about even the, dealing with larger glands with the resume uh, or water vapor therapy. And so I think if you really have only one choice, one thing to buy, you want versatility. You want to be able to offer something that really you can use for most patients that walk in the door. Um, and I, I still think that there's the, these other treatments, the other mistreatments have their role, have their place. Um, and, 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 and certainly I, I, do, I, I do most of them. Uh, I have learned most of them and, and, and are comfortable with most of them. But I think if you're really talking about one that is a one trick for, that, that will really take care of everyone that walks in the door, I think that's, that's a no-brainer. Okay. This is a typical picture of a, a big intravesical component, and there's a lot of different types of therapies that we can actually do for that. Um, okay, same case, except now it's 125 grams. So you have about nine minutes, and we have two cases I want to get through quickly. So this, this is the same scenario for the patient, but his prostate is now 125 grams, by lobe or hypertrophy. We did it specifically for that reason. Um, we can do electrical surgical TUR, a mist, green light, homium thulium, aquablation, or simple prostatectomy. So, Mike, which is which would be your go-to on this patient? So, you know, I think this was this is a sort of a layup question, as they say. Um, you know, th these are these are, and again, the AOA guidelines don't actually address this actual scenario. Or don't don't address it very well. Uh, you have a young patient who has failed behavioral plant extract and medical therapy. And is sexually active and, and wishes to, and which is very important, and wants to stay uh, um, keep ejaculation as well. And you have a large prostate greater than 80 grams, and that sort of by the AUA guidelines already puts you into a whole different category. But the problem is that that other category definitely starts to affect uh, sexual behavior, sexual uh, dysfunction. Um, obviously, we, we can certainly go into what those other techniques are, such as whole lab, 
uh, TULEP, uh, PVPs, simple prostatectomies. They're all great uh, procedures for taking care of large, gland, uh, large glands. But of course, uh, as we all know, erectile dysfunction, retrograde ejaculation, ejaculation disorder is, a, is a, almost a, 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 um, a given in many of these procedures. And so therefore, in a younger, younger male, unless he's willing to sort of take that chance, he's really not going to be very interested in those procedures. And, and so we start, need to start looking at something that uh, makes more sense. Um, we, you know, at our institution, uh, we did perform a, a study, although a relatively small study, in the resume patients in the convective water therapy uh, patients for uh, glands that are above 80 grams. Um, we looked at approximately 38 patients that uh, had, or 206 uh, uh, patients that we did resume on. And we found that uh, patients actually did respond very nicely, even in this larger sort of series, uh, with reduction in their IPSS scores, reduction in their uh, quality of life scores, uh, improvement in their quality of life scores, uh, and reduction in their PVR. Um, we did, of course, find that they had you know, almost double the amount of uh, um, uh, issues in terms of hematuria, postoperative uh, retention, uh, even UTIs and urosepsis, almost, almost double rate rates compared to sort of the, what the pivotal trial showed. However, I think in a, in a patient who's 55, if you counsel him appropriately, let him know that this is a possibility, you were really doubling your, your adverse reactions, um, he may be willing to do that. And, and on, top, on top of that, if it doesn't work as well as you'd like it, we still have those other options. So I think that in, in my mind, if I'm going to go, be, if I'm 55 and I'm, I'm at a point now where I need a procedure, but sexual function is extremely important to me, uh, I think doing a uh, convective water, water vapor therapy makes the most sense uh, in terms of what's available for us right now on the market. And that, of course, may change. Uh, but that's the one that's probably going to have the least amount of sexual side effects and, and certainly is the one that will, can potentially work quite well. So just, again, just for our audience, um, there's no one right answer. And I think we just want to emphasize that. You know, we're giving a lot of different choices and Mike went through uh, actually, all our panels have gone through the pros and cons of each of them. And, you know, people who do homium and they do a lot of them will have very good results or green lights or uh, you heard some of the data with uh, with Resume. Uh, some people would do simple prostatectomy, either it's, uh, open or robotic. Uh, we've done a lot of aquablation on these patients so uh, and TRs. So, again, I just want to reemphasize that there's no right or wrong here and there's a lot of different types of ways of doing it. We just want to give you the pros and cons. So we have about five minutes left and have about a minute of slides to include there. Um, Brian, um, just in a moment or so, what would you do, what do you typically do in this particular patient? I think I'd probably use high pressure saline hydrodissection. Uh, it's the lowest uh, risk of ejaculatory dysfunction for this patient. It is capable of treating this volume just as well as it's capable of treating smaller volumes. I will point out that the uh, AUA guidelines as they sit today are a little confusing on this topic because they only indicate uh, high pressure hydrodissection up to 80 grams. You know, I think that is because the initial data was only accomplished in that size range. Subsequent papers that have been published have certainly studied it in much larger glands. I'm hopeful that with our next update, they'll take that into account and we'll see it reflect it. And actually, I think that larger prostates are really where the power of uh, aqua ablation is most impressive. And so that would be my short answer. Okay, Dean. Uh, I would agree with Brian. For, for this particular patient with a large gland wanting to preserve sexual function, the data does say that aquablation uh, has the ability to preserve ejaculatory function and have very good improvements in maximum flow rates and IPSS. So uh, I, would, I would pick aquablation. And that's what I would do as well, although I think we would offer uh, water therapy as well uh, with Resume. I think that's a reasonable thing to do. Okay, last case, uh, we have about three minutes to talk about this patient, he's anticoagulated. Does that change the ball game for anybody here? So I'll go from top down, Brian. Uh, I mean, according to the guidelines, again, three procedures are specifically indicated in, in patients who are at high medical risk uh, of bleeding. Uh, that's the enucleation procedures, whether it's with holmium or thulium, a holep or a thulep. Uh, and then the third one is a green light, uh, photoselective. Um, I, I think that any of those three would be good candidates for this anticoagulated patient. Obviously, I think all three of them would cure urinary retention. Uh, I mean, in, in my own hands, it would probably be a, uh, a green light with 180 watt, which I think I can treat a prostate of this size pretty effectively. Okay, Dean. Uh, 
Uh, I would generally go with a green light laser. I feel pretty comfortable doing these size prostates. And if he absolutely had to stay on his blood thinner, that would definitely be my choice. Uh, now, if he could come off of his blood thinner, which the majority of patients who are on blood thinners can, uh, then I still think aquablation is a very reasonable option. It hasn't really changed the scenario from our prior case. Again, you have to get good hemostasis, which is again, new, the new standard of care with focal bladder neck cautery. Uh, so again, it really depends a little bit on whether you can stop a blood thinner or not. Okay, and Mike? Uh, I agree. I, I, uh, the, the amount of patients that need to actually stay in anticoagulation or that we can transition to, for instance, some type of, some type of bridging therapy uh, is really minimal these days. Uh, and many of the cardiologists can work with us uh, in these types of scenarios. Um, Again, uh, for a patient like this, I'd be comfortable with uh, a convective water therapy. On the other hand, if we have to put the patient back on anticoagulation relatively quickly, we do run the risk of sort of delayed uh, hematuria at a later date. Uh, and therefore, one of the other procedures such as uh, uh, a tulium uh, or a, a whole left or something along those lines might be the better answer and, and still goes within our guidelines, of course. Right, and, and that's the point. These, these kind of all fit in terms of what would be recommended. Just for folks to know who are on the on the uh, on our conference tonight, there are some other therapies. Just be aware of uh, there are stent therapies that are coming back, and there is a host of companies that are looking at this, uh, and they're involved in clinical trials and trying to figure out what's the right patient. So you'll hear a lot about that. Uh, I'm also the principal investigator for a trial using a balloon dilation of the prostate with an anterior commissurotomy, but using a medication called paclitaxel. Uh, that uh, coats the balloon and we, we believe reduces inflammation. We've had really some outstanding data we'll be presenting in Las Vegas as well. So just be aware that there's new stuff coming on. They're not in the guidelines because we haven't done those uh, uh, in the process of doing those trials. So we just wanna keep you up to date about that. So as we close this out, uh, these are some of the AUA clinical guidelines statement just to be aware of. Clinicians should perform a PBR assessment prior to surgical intervention for lower urinary tract symptoms attributed to BPH. We consider that to be a clinical principle. And it's an interesting and long discussion about how we get into these recommendations. But as we all sat around and drinking a lot of beers, uh, this is what we came up with. Uh, cl clinicians should consider uroflometry prior to surgical intervention for lower urinary tract symptoms. And patients should consider uh, pre uh, pressure flow studies prior to surgical intervention for lower urinary tract symptoms to BPH when diagnostic uncertainty exists, and that is an expert opinion. And clinicians should inform patients of the possibility of therapy, of tra therapeutic failure, and the need for additional secondary treatments when considering surgical and minimally invasive treatments for LUTs secondary to BPH. And how we define treatment failure is going to be a whole new avenue of exploration. How we, and, and that is a big controversy, or at least uh, something that we're trying to figure out. There's going to be data about retreatment and how we define it. It's gonna be a lot of fun to figure this out and try to level the playing field, but that's one of the things that I think is gonna be important for folks who are leaders in BPH, like our three faculty members and those in the community and try to get that together in terms of what's actually going on. And finally, clinical uh, statement seven, and Brian alluded to that, that surgery is recommended for patients who have renal insufficiency secondary to BPH, refractory urinary tension secondary to BPH, recurrent UTIs, recurrent bladder stones, or gross immaturity due to BPH, with or without low urinary tract symptoms attributed to BPH and unwilling, uh, refractory to or unwilling to use other therapies, and that's a clinical principle. There's a lot more on the guidelines. Please uh, stay tuned to the new guidelines uh, that are coming out in Las Vegas um, uh, in September. So with that, we're now gonna turn to specific surgical techniques. And I'm gonna turn the mantle over to Dr. Mazzarella, who will talk about prostatic cubase for lift. Perfect, thanks so much, Steve. Thanks for guiding us through those cases. So I'm gonna start um, with a little overview of kind of the pivotal, pivotal data that exists with prostatic urethral lift. Uh, I'll mention a couple of other just small studies that I think are important to be aware of in the clinical setting. Uh, and then I'll give you a few minutes of a surgical video um, that I created to talk about both Eurolift uh, as a procedure in whole, some technical elements to it, what its mechanism of action is like, and also a little flavor of what performing the procedure in the office is like. Brief disclosures, I'm both a consultant and an investigator to Neotract Teleflex who makes Eurolift. So the first study to talk about is the LIFT study, and this is um, Eurolift's initial pivotal trial. 
And so one of the things that's very interesting about this is it was, I think, one of the first studies that has really begun to change the standard of evidence that we can expect in the world of BPH. And I think gone are the days when large retrospective studies were going to be enough data for us to consider new treatment options. And so this was a um, five-year data, 206 patients that were randomized and blinded, randomized two to one to receive a prostatic urethral lift versus a sham. They went so far in terms of creation for the sham that they performed a rigid cystoscopy. They had a device that looked and felt like delivering a Eurolift implant, but did not actually deliver it. And this is the take home at one year from, from the LIFT study. And so the pre-procedure IPSS for these patients was 22. The improvement in IPSS um, corresponded to about 11 points or about a 50% reduction. That drop in IPSS was very rapid, in most cases occurring within a few weeks to a month. Uh, in this slide, you can see that that improvement in IPSS was durable out to one year. But this horizontal blue line is that same data carried out to five years. And so the five-year IPSS uh, results from the LIFT study were presented at 2017 AUA. The other point I like to make is that really all of the other clinical trials uh, around prostatic urethral lift had very similar results. And I think um, as someone that conducts clinical trials myself, you know, number one, the multicentricity, in fact, international results from this study. Number two, the reproducibility that comes with it, which is to say, you can see a, a registry study that was enrolled out of Europe. And as a side note, that registry study was enough uh, on review of the FDA to indicate uh, prostatic urethral lift up to 100 grams, although it remains only indicated to 80 grams in the AUA guideline. There's another study here, which we're going to speak about momentarily, BPH6, which was a head-to-head -head randomized trial of Eurolift versus TERP. And I think, again, the take-home point is that the data is very, very robust about the IPSS improvement uh, that comes with Eurolift, highly reproducible. This is the side effect profile that came from the LIFT study. And so you can see the comparison of the treatment versus the control patients. You know, I think um, prostatic urethral LIFT is uh, a very minimally invasive treatment option for our patients. I also think that if you're not warning them that there is some recovery, you're certainly going to have a group of unhappy patients. And so dysuria, hematuria, frequency, urgency, those are absolutely things that I warn patients about in the early post-operative period. Clinically, I tell patients to expect those things for one to two weeks. Um, you know, to be honest, I think in most cases they resolve sooner than that. We can certainly quibble a little bit with the relative rates that are presented here. For instance, the LIFT study reported an 18% risk of pelvic pain. I think to be honest, in modern prostatic urethral lift, the risk of pelvic pain is much lower than that. On the other hand, the LIFT study reported an only 7% risk of urgency. And I think basically all of my patients have some transient urgency in the early post-operative period. I think a couple of really important points that come with this is number one, the risk of UTI was very low. And I think that fact is uh, in large part due to the fact that the vast majority of Eurolift patients do not need a catheter. In the LIFT study, it was around 20 to 25% went home with a Foley catheter. The subsequent clinical data has actually shown that that rate has dropped out in modern clinical practice. Uh, and you know um, that I think is a very important element for a lot of our patients. The other point I would make from this is the LIFT study showed no de novo incidence of sustained ejaculatory or erectile function, the dysfunction. And I think that's an important point um, in that this is sort of redefined how we think about sexual function. So what that term actually means, de novo and sustained ejaculatory function, uh, dysfunction, is problems that occur within three months of the index procedure and thus directly attributable to the procedure and then persist out to 12 months. And this has become a common term to use in a lot of different studies subsequently. This is BPH6, and so this was a um, randomized head-to-head -head study of uh, prostatic urethral lift versus TERP. Patients were under 80 grams. They were randomized to one treatment or the other. They defined six primary endpoints and then created a composite primary endpoint. And so they essentially said, if you can have a reduction in IPSS greater than 30%, a recovery greater than 70% of one month, maintenance of erectile function, maintenance of ejaculatory function, maintenance of continence, and maintenance uh, a high degree of safety, then that we think that defines a successful BPH procedure. And so 46% of prostatic urethral lift uh, patients met all six of those co-primary co endpoints compared to only 22 of TUR patients. 
There are a couple of more granular points I would make to this, which is that uh, the IPSS reduction did remain greater in the TUR group than the prostatic urethral lift group. Uh, that underlies a comment that's existed in the AUA guidelines stating that patients should be aware that IPSS reduction with prostatic urethral lift uh, is not as great as the IPSS reduction with TUR, and I think that's a fair assessment of that. The other point I would make is somewhat the opposite, which is 82% of uh, prostatic urethral lift patients were recovered at one month compared to only approximately half of TUR patients. And I didn't include the graphs for you today, but uh, multiple of those will show that patients are more recovered and more satisfied with their procedure when we look at quality of life perspectives with a prostatic urethral lift than a TUR. And again, remember that at least in theory, these are equivalent cohorts since they are a randomized patient population. Two final trials I wanted to allude to briefly. One is the MedLift study. And so I told you earlier that the current AUA clinical guidelines say uh, prostatic urethral lift is contraindicated with obstructing median lobes. That's because the original lift trial did not enroll patients who had obstructing median lobes. Subsequently, the MedLift trial was conducted and that had 43 patients, I believe, all of whom had their median lobe treated with Urolift devices using a, the technique that kind of lateralizes it. And you can see three curves here. You can see the sham arm of the original lift trial. You can see then below that the treatment arm of the original lift trial. And then you can see all the patients who are in the med lift trial. And as I said, the AUA guidelines have not yet reflected this. On the other hand, the FDA now formally indicates prostatic urethral lift for treating an obstructing median lobe. And that's based on this data. And the last study I wanted to highlight was presented two years ago at the AUA now, which is the Pulsar study. And so this is looking specifically at prostatic urethral lift for patients who are in retention. 52 patients uh, across six sites in the UK. Uh, it's important to note that the patients were older with larger prostates than the lift study, and they were quite significantly catheter dependent. These were not patients that just failed their voiding trial on Friday and enrolled on a Monday. On average, they had been catheter dependent for close to four months. And yet what it showed is that by one month, 67%, and by three months, 79% of these patients were free of their catheter. And I think that's an important point to keep in mind as we think of prostatic urethral lift because in many ways I think we're pairing the essentially most minimally invasive treatment option for patients with a fairly advanced um, BPH patient in terms of disease status and yet we're able to show pretty good efficacy even in these larger prostates, older patients, advanced BPH. So I'd like to move now into my surgical video. Um, it has audio included. I'll apologize in advance. It moves pretty quickly in terms of my um, narration, but I think we'll have some time at the end for questions. I'm gonna start with a brief overview uh, of the procedure itself. And while the whole point of today's conversation is to go over the nuances of prostatic urethral lift, I wanna first point out that it's generally a very straightforward procedure. You can see in this coronal cross section of the prostate and the bladder, and the sheath is placed into the bladder, the device is placed through the sheath. The whole concept of prostatic urethral lift involves placing an implant that compresses and lifts the lateral lobes of the prostate, uh, such that the lateral lobe of the prostate is compressed um, to relieve any obstruction. The sequence of delivery is done in a simple four-step process. There are four buttons that are pushed in the correct order. The first of those, the safety is released. The blue trigger will deploy the needle as you're about to see. The blue and gray trigger retracts the needle and tensions the device. And the final step is to deploy the urethral end piece. This is done sequentially uh, with a typical prostatic urethral lift procedure. Four to six implants are necessary um, to get adequate retraction. I wanna pause and highlight the implant itself, which is composed of three parts a capsular tab, a piece of uh, proline suture, and then a stainless steel urethral end piece. Now that you have some good understanding of the procedure, I want to move um, to some specific discussion about performing prostatic urethral lift in the office, which I think offers some significant advantages. Primarily patient comfort with an in-office procedure versus surgery. Surgeon efficiency when done in the office is unparalleled. Uh, there's a broad range of anesthesia options that we're going to talk about. And the final point I would make about in-office prostatic urethral lift is if you're used to doing the procedure in the operating room, it's coded differently. The room setup is generally very straightforward for a cysto room. You need a cysto tower with a light source. You need some method of irrigation. You need a way of disposing of the used devices and collecting the irrigation from the sheet. The patient should be positioned level and symmetrical on the bed, and you will need either stirrups or potentially even better fins. <laughs> 
This is the scope set that's unique to Eurolift in particular. There's a visual obturator on the top. The procedure is done through this narrow 20 front sheath, uh, and the lens is a 2.9 millimeter lens. Some final words about an office setup. You want a consistent setup from time to time. You want all supplies available prior to the procedure, and you need to sure you have enough devices ready prior to starting the procedure itself. There's a broad range of anesthesia options that can be used in an office setting that range from using a Eurojet only all the way to an IV sedative, intraurethral or intravesical or a combination. Uh, local can be used. You can use a prostate block, which is what I do and I'll show you momentarily. Nitrous is increasingly used. PO or IV sedatives are also options. The truss blockade for a prostatic urethral lift is generally fairly similar to that for a biopsy. However, there are two salient differences I like to point out. And one is that you want to anesthetize near the bladder neck, and two is that you want to anesthetize distally uh, near the apex and towards the distal sphincter. You can see that in the diagram. In that middle picture, you can see a sagittal uh, way of placing um, the lidocaine near the bladder neck. And on the far right, you see a transverse, which is how I do the procedure, with the yellow line showing the needle path. I'm gonna move now to actually taking you through one of my in-office Eurolift cases, and we'll stop and highlight some particular points. The first of which is at the start of the case, you adjust the focus from the bladder uh, to the tip of the device that you're seeing in that cystoscopic screen. Rotations are made in the bladder, and you see me here backing up from the bladder neck, and that's an important point to highlight. With a typical prostatic urethral lift, you back up 1.5 centimeters from the bladder neck, but your preoperative workup requires that you quantify any additional intravesical extension, and that's done in this retroflexed view uh, or on the ultrasound, and it's necessary to take that into account um, prior to the procedure. Going back now to my procedure, as I mentioned, the goal of prostatic urethral lift is to create an anterior channel, and so you can see me in the anterior third of the prostate. I compress and lower my hands, and I like to highlight that this needs to be done somewhat simultaneously. You don't want to compress laterally and then lower your hands. It should be done with a small amount of rotation above horizontal and then in a diagonal direction. You can see before I deploy the first needle, I correlate between the screen and my hands, and then I warn the patient before I pull the trigger and deploy the needle. Typically, that verbal anesthesia is most important on the first deployment, which somewhat surprises patients and is not necessary thereafter. As I advance towards the bladder neck and attach the urethral end piece, you need to be sure you're not too close to the bladder neck as is visible in this particular picture. The question is, would it be exposed to static urine? In that picture, it would be and would need to be removed. In general, that's very rare with prostatic urethral lift after a small amount of uh, experience. I want to highlight how the device's exchange is done, which is that it should be done smoothly and efficiently. You can see I maintain control of the sheath at all times. I unlock the device. Otherwise, my assistant exchanges the device care is taken uh, to make sure we're careful with the lens. As I start my second implant, I want to point out irrigation management, which is very judicious in the office, and that I'm always very particular about maintaining my lens in a vertical orientation so that I always uh, am aware of where I'm placing my devices. As I treat the patient's right side, you can see that I switched my hands. This particular surgeon did not take that approach. And while that's okay, you can see the device was not designed ergonomically this way. And so I do think best practice is to learn how to switch your hands so that you can operate the device the way you see me uh, um, deflecting laterally. As I place my second device on the patient's right side near the bladder neck, uh, I want to highlight the angle of deflection, which uh, is recommended to be approximately 20 degrees. And more importantly, I want to highlight the fact that I maintain that angle of deflection throughout the delivery sequence. And so even as I'm advancing um, and attaching the urethral end piece, you can see my hands stay lateral. Uh, I want to pause uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about advancing and attaching the urethral end piece and this concept of the white line. And so you're going to see um, a, a blown up image of that momentarily on your screen where you can see uh, here's the tip of the device, the suture is visible, and the white line is halfway across. That's necessary because that's the optimal time to attach the urethral end piece to the suture. However, I'm going to continue to highlight the fact that it's not necessarily required. And in fact, the engineers have shown that the device will uh, be placed adequately over 95% of the time, even if you're not exactly halfway across. I'm moving now to uh, my third placement, which is the apical placement on the patient's left side. Um, you can see that I start at the distal viru, and I think that's another important point comparing prostatic urethral lift to other procedures we have. Here's a patient of mine who had a previous TERP, and because of the energy associated with most other BPH procedures, you need to be very careful about not damaging the distal sphincter. Because Eurolift uses no energy, uh, you can be a bit more aggressive about starting distally. And you'll see as I move proximally, I still end up uh, 
plenty uh, adequately away from the distal sphincter. You'll see that I maintain a slow cadence throughout my entire implant delivery sequence, and that will be true through every implant that I place in this case and really any case. And then I want to highlight how we cleanly release the device from the implant. And the way you do that is to back up slightly after you complete the delivery process before you advance all the way into the bladder. This is the final device exchange I'm gonna show you, and then subsequently thereafter, I've cut the device exchanges um, for the sake of time. We're moving on to my fourth implant, which is on the patient's right side. And I wanna move now to talking about some sort of troubleshooting elements and some more advanced techniques um, related to how to do in-office prosthetic urethral lift. And so uh, you can see that I will encounter a small amount of bleeding, which I'm able to successfully clear in this case just by titrating my irrigation, which is an important step. Uh, you can also have your assistant squeeze the bag to generate a bit more pressure if that's necessary. In this particular case, that's enough to get good visualization. However, I'm going to show you another deployment from a different case where that's not adequate. So first the air bubble, and then the surgeon deploys the needle, and unfortunately this flap of tissue obscures their view, and they troubleshoot this exactly right, which is that they use uh, essentially muscle memory to advance to the right spot. They attempt to clear it, however, when they're unable, they simply attach the urethral end piece, and in that case, it's successful, as it uh, very, very commonly is in real-world applications of prostatic urethral lift. Another troubleshooting element I want to talk about that you're going to see in my case is as I go forward, you can see that I advance the white line just a little bit beyond halfway and back up a tiny amount. I've pulled in another uh, element from a different case in, in which they advance uh, even further than that, and I want to show how they troubleshoot it and that, again, the implant uh, deployment is successful. And so we'll go through the normal process. The needle is deployed. The needle will be retracted. You want smooth and quiet hands, and I think uh, not having that quite as much in this case uh, leads to the problem you're about to see, which is that as they advance, the white line goes all the way across. And so they appropriately back up to where it is halfway um, into the window. And again, the deployment is successful, even though that's not the exact optimal approach we're looking for. I'm moving now to my fifth and then sixth implants where we use some sort of advanced techniques with prostatic urethral lift. And so this is a stacking technique, and I use this very commonly uh, in slightly larger prostates. I start directly above my distal implant. Uh, I use a bit more anterior rotation. The goal is to sort of further develop that anterior channel. By starting level with my distal implant, I ensure that the final location will be a little bit proximal to it. And so it would result in this sort of staggered uh, stacking approach that you see on the right side. On the left side, there's another stacking approach um, that's even, and that's much less commonly used. That's typically reserved for small prostates where you're trying to get a 360 degree opening, uh, which is not employed nearly as often with a prostatic urethral lift. I'm moving now to my sixth and final implant, and we're going to talk about two other um, sort of troubleshooting elements. And so the first one is, is that at two spots here, you're going to see me sort of test the tissue for the optimal place to put this implant. And so I go into this expecting that I'll use the same technique as I would on the patient's left side. And yet when I place my device above the distal uh, implant, I find that there's just not very much space. I could deploy here safely, but it doesn't get very good retraction. And so I test gently and as a traumatic as possible, uh, and then I decide that I'm actually going to look at a different approach. And so what I'm going to use here is what's called more of a sweeping technique. Now I've dropped down below, I test, and I feel like this is actually going to result in a better retraction of this lateral lobe tissue. And so after testing the tissue, uh, I deploy this sweeping technique to lift uh, and suspend the lateral lobes uh, out of the way. Subsequent parts of this delivery sequence uh, is exactly as you've seen in the previous five implants. Uh, for the final part of this case, I placed a visual obturator in for a lasting uh, exam uh, of the procedure. And in, in the real world setting, I probably would not have gone back with the visual obturator as I try to minimize my trips through the bladder neck and in and out, um, both to minimize the recovery period uh, and to minimize irritation of the bladder neck. The point of this is not to ensure that you have a TUR-like defect, but actually to look at your implant location. You can see the bladder net collapse nicely. My proximal implants are well positioned, well tensioned. They have good retraction. The same is true for my distal implants there. And so ultimately I feel comfortable with the final outcome and the procedure is completed.
So for some final conclusions, uh, I think as you think about prostatic urethral lift performed in an office setting, office setup and flow is very important. There are some challenges unique to each office. There are many anesthesia options which you can tailor to your individual setting. Careful pre-op workup is a necessary a step, especially with attention paid to intravesical extension. Patient comfort um, should be maximized and good surgical technique will maximize your outcomes, your ability to relieve obstruction and symptoms for our patients. In conclusion, I want to thank all of you for your time and one final thank you to the AUA for the opportunity to speak to all of you today. Um, I appreciate it and I'm honored. I think with that, uh, I'll echo my pre-recorded uh, appreciation of the AUA of, for uh, all of you for joining for the other faculty and turn it over to Dr. Polisi for his uh, upcoming talk. Thank you, Brian, appreciate it. Um, I'm going to be discussing the convective water vapor therapy. Uh, my disclosures are that I'm a fellowship director for the minimally invasive surgery program at Mount Sinai. And part of that uh, fellowship is sponsored uh, by Boston Scientific. So what exactly is convective water vapor uh, energy or therapy? Um, what are the unique properties that make it different from some of the other technologies that we're presenting today and certainly what's also on, out on the market? Um, so what's the basic principle? The basic principle is that we're using radio frequency power to heat a determined or a predetermined amount of sterile water to change it from a liquid state to a vapor state. When we change it from that liquid to vapor state, it then disperses a stored thermal energy, which is the heat source that we use to ablate prostate tissue. Now, this is important because when the stored thermal energy gets dispersed within the prosthetic cell membranes, it's basically taking prostate tissue that rests about 37 degrees Celsius and then quickly and rapidly bringing it up to at least 70 degrees Celsius or more it, it uh, brings an immediate and irreversible cell death. This is the, the principle behind why this works so well is because of this work, wet thermal energy. So the property of convective versus conductive energy is, is the main principle of why uh, convective water vapor therapy works. Uh, the water vapor is, is dispersed evenly throughout the interstices of the cell membranes in the prostate tissue. It can create, create sort of a uniform, uh, diffuse thermal energy and diffuse uh, um, energy source around all these membranes, which then uh, allows for cell death. This is different than conductive uh, thermal energy, which is something that we do see in other properties or other BPH treatments, such as, for instance, microwave therapies, where the conductive heat transfers from cell to cell, and there's a non-uniform heat gradient that, that goes across that cell. So obviously, the cells that are closer to the heat gradient are going to die first, while the ones that are further away are going to be less likely to have cell death. One of the final and uh, third unique uh, categories that makes uh, this, this type of therapy very different is that when you treat the different zones of the prostate, the water vapor therapy remains within those zones. So it, it confines itself to the prostate anatomy inside the boundaries. So obviously, if we're working in the transition zone, where the lateral lobes are, uh, the water vapor stays within there. If we're working the central zone, it stays within where the median, median lobe is. And obviously in the peripheral zone, same thing. This next video helps to demonstrate exactly how that works. So we can see on the left side, we have uh, the ultrasound uh, that's correlating with what's going on uh, in the cystoscopic view on the right side. Um, so we're, we're, we're attaching ourselves to look at specifically at the right transition zone we're about to inject into that area and we're going to then uh, over a nine second period where we're injecting the wet thermal energy, uh, we'll get to watch how there's dispersion and uniform dispersion of the vapor energy at this time. So in the first second, you'll see uh, as it goes through, you'll see that the dispersion is, is almost complete within the entire right uh, transition zone. And then the next eight seconds, that nine second slot is actually the kill zone, the kill time period when the, when the cells actually uh, are, are being uh, destroyed. 
if we look at this uh, going forward, uh, in the first post-week period, you can see very nicely that uh, in the transition zones, we see these sort of ablative areas uh, that uh, correlate with where the uh, destruction or the dispersion of the vapor was. If you look back three months later in the same MRI, you can see that the dispersion is, is completely gone, uh, that these areas that they were bladed are now completely resolved or resorbed. In addition, the process actually started to look a little bit smaller. The, the bladder started to show a little bit more capacity. And so we can still some, see some real-time changes that occur when using uh, this therapy. Um, when you go back and look in cystoscopically, this is even more impressive. Uh, there's almost a sort of a, a, a sort of post-TUR effect that can occur. And this particular patient uh, was 52 grams. Uh, there were uh, nine treatments performed, uh, three in the right lateral lobe, four in the left lateral lobe, and two in the median lobe. And six months later, when you look inside, you really see a very nice defect in the middle of the, uh, of, of the cystoscopic view. So what are the indications and contraindications to performing this procedure? Um, right now, the, the, uh, the AUA guidelines uh, are indicated for patients that are 50 years of age or, or, or older. Uh, prostate volumes between 30 and 80 grams, although we've discussed that there is a possibility to use this in larger uh, volume uh, prostates as well. Uh, it's definitely indicated for treatment of prostates with hyperplasia of the central zone and or the median lobe. And again, contraindication uh, is anyone who has a urinary sphincter implant, a penile prosthesis, and an active urinary tract infection. So what are some of the important concepts to understand prior to performing convective water vapor therapy? Well, the main objective is to create sort of a contiguous overlapping lesion between the bladder neck and the pro and proximal to the virum montanum, each about one centimeter apart. We want to target the bulk of the adenoma and follow the natural slope of the urethra. So this means that uh, for each treatment, uh, so each centimeter treatment, you want to sort of look exactly at how long or how, how long the, the prostate goes from the bladder neck to the virum. So obviously uh, someone who has a, a two centimeter uh, uh, urethral length, you probably want to use between one and two treatments per lobe, so up to between two and four in total. And again, depending on sort of how long uh, the prostate is, will we'll, uh, dictate how many more uh, treatments you do. Uh, this is a nice uh, video also demonstrating how you measure that, uh, so what's called the field of view. Um, each field of view measures approximately five millimeters. Again, this is from the device tip down to where the arms are sort of out of your view, so it's about five millimeters. If you look on the right-hand side here, you'll see they're going one, two, three, four times from the bladder neck down to the view, so approximately two centimeters. So we know that each lobe will need at least two uh, ablations at that time. So we're going to talk a little bit more about what some of the best practice summary is for performing this procedure. Uh, some of the more details, clinical details, will be in the video that we're going to show at the end. Uh, but just to highlight uh, some tips and tricks, we generally want to start about one centimeter away from the bladder neck. You want to concentrate the, the energy away from the bladder neck because this will lead to some very prolonged irritative symptoms. You want to place treatments at least one centimeter apart. You want to overlap these treatments so there's a uni uniform ablation across the tissue. You want to treat within the treatment guidelines. Obviously, you don't want to under-treat. You don't want to over-treat. So clearly, having a good uh, visualization and also knowing the exact measurements of your prostate is very important. You want to target the bulk of the adenoma. You want to optimize vapor coverage of the obstructed tissue. Generally recommend treating one lateral lobe, com la one lab lo one lobe completely, then moving over to the contralateral lobe to, all to facilitate accurate measurement and minimize device movement. You want to go ahead and treat the median lobe or, uh, and elevated central zone. Again, one of the advantages for using this technique, the pivotal study shows that there's an additional three-point improvement in IPSS score if you go ahead and do this. Steep prostates or sort of high riding prostates. Generally, we, we start at the proximal viru. This will help denervate and relax the prostate tissue to allow for passage of the bladder neck. And I think one of the most important parts of this uh, procedure is not to move around too much. You want to minimize your exploratory movements, make sure that you've already assessed the patient with a preoperative cystoscopy uh, before you go ahead and actually perform the procedure. You want to minimize the amount of bleeding and obscuring, vis obscuring visibility as possible. What's the long-term data? Um, we have now our five-year data that's uh, going to be published in September of uh, 2021 in the Journal of Urology. Um, this was a randomized uh, trial of 197 patients with 61 control uh, patients, uh, randomized to either undergoing the uh, water vapor therapy or a rigid cystoscopy. Patients that were brought into the rigid cystoscopy or sham group were allowed to then enter into the actual water vapor, 
water vapor therapy group approximately three to six months afterwards. So you have what's called the crossover group. Prostates were between 30 and 80 grams. Also patients with median lobes were included. Um, durability analysis was one of the more important uh, uh, factors that were looked at. And there was a 60 month follow-up that occurred. So when we look at overall data of the IPSS and the QMAX score, we see that by three months, uh, there are some major reductions uh, in the IPSS score, as well as in, in improvements in the QMAX, almost 50%. This is also sustained uh, with quality of life and the BPH uh, uh, impact index. Sexual function, uh, there was no de novo erectile dysfunction and limited impact on sexual function. Uh, there was some demonstration of de decrease in uh, ejaculate volume, uh, about 3% to 7%, depending on which group you looked at, but overall no sexual dysfunction uh, based on what, uh, what was seen. Procedural times were approximately uh, four to five minutes, depending on which group you looked at, and the mean number of vapor injections was between four and five uh, for each group. So this is one of the more important slides. Uh, what about the retreatment rates through, the through these five years? And you can see that uh, by year three, there was a 4.4% surgical retreatment rate that, that didn't change over the course of the next three to five years. Uh, and so that's a very, a tremendous stability with, uh, with the water uh, vapor treatment. However, medical therapy was uh, seen to in in increase over time up to 11.1% by year five. So what are some of the key takeaways what we've seen? We've seen proven durability for the treatment of BPH, a 4.4% surg surgical retreatment rate through five years, 11.1% medical retreatment rate through five years for these patients, uh, significant sustained improvement of LUTs and quality of life with a 48% improvement through five years with IPSS, a 44% improvement uh, for QMAX, 45% improvement of IPSS, and 48% improvement of BPH uh, uh, impact index. We're able to treat patients with the hyperplasia of the lateral lobes, the central zone, as well as the middle lobe. It's done in office, just as the PUL. There's long-term safety, and now sexual function also is something that uh, is preserved. So with that, uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. McVary, who also has graciously uh, allowed me to use some of his slides, as well as provide uh, many of the, uh, provide the video which we're about to look at. Here's our first case, 31 grams. I'm calling this the easy peasy treatment. Um, the scope is advanced per urethra. And up here, I have a cartoon, the left and right lateral lobes, the median bar that you'll soon see. And what I'm thinking I'm planning on this, this case I've called the easy peasy. The instrument into, uh, up to the bladder neck is then brought back to the Vero Montanum, again, confirming um, what, you, what your treatment planning is going to be. We advance the scope to the bladder neck. Once there, at the three o'clock position, pull back two fields of view. At two fields of view, you're in a safe position. You deliver the first treatment. And in nine seconds, this portion of the treatment is done. Uh, you saw a little bit of bubbling going on there. That was some steam leaking out. I micro-adjusted the instrument, and that stopped. Again, this is a 31-gram prostate, so I'm back to the Viru confirming my safe position, placing my needle just proximal to the Viru level, I deliver the second treatment on the left side. Pretty straightforward case. Once that nine second treatment is done, I'm gonna advance the scope up to the bladder neck. Again, position my scope at the nine o'clock position now and deliver the two planned treatments on the right lateral lobe. If there's any leakage, I adjust that scope just a tiny bit, and that tends to block any steam leakage um, bubble. Um, uh, the bubbles that you see in the field will, will slow down or stop entirely. Again, the treatment's ongoing right now, no leakage at all. Because it's a smaller gland, I'm back to the Viru, confirming my safe position place my last treatment into the right lateral lobe. Again, con consistent with um, this uh, diagram. Now, we had a little bit of a median bar, and I'm going to get that. So once these treatments are done, 
instead of pulling the scope out, I'm back to the bladder neck and I'm going to move one field of view off and place that last treatment into the middle lobe. Remember, each injection is about nine seconds of treatment, so we're moving along pretty nice in this particular patient. Let's go on to the next one. So our, our next patient, uh, more complicated, 41 grams, and then what I call the interlocking lateral lobes. The idea here is a more challenging case where you can customize the treatment to the topography of the prostate that's shown. A little bit of red out, don't freak out. Um, I was able to clear that off pretty fast. I've scouted it out from bladder neck to vera montanum. Heavily trabeculated bladder, as you can see. And you can see these. this prostate is big and it's kind of interlocked. And that's, I'm thinking I, I need to do something about that. Back to the bladder neck. I go to the three o'clock position, and I'm gonna lay down the first of the treatments, which is uh, represented just two fields of view off the bladder neck in this position here. Sounds good. Now I'm gonna find my Viru, so I can safely advance my scope just a little bit proximal to that and deliver my second treatment, again, at the three o'clock position. Now we're going to do the same thing on the left lateral side at the nine o'clock, excuse me, right lateral side at the nine o'clock position, again represented here. Very little loss of steam, so I'm getting good um, injection. I saw my Viru advance slightly and I lay down the fourth treatment. Now, Again, a little bit more challenging because there's some extra tissue. You can see it sticking in there, and that is going to bother me, and I'm going to come back to that. But I'm going to lay down a treatment in the, at the, this median bar, which is a little bit of an issue visually. And I'm going to find those two areas which are bothering me, those interdigitating lobes. So I'm going to position my scope and try and get that steam into that particular spot on one side and then the next. A little bit of bubble loss there. And I think you get the idea. Customization. So another concept is less is more. I have another 31 gram prostate, but because of a conversation with the patient, I'm going to minimize my treatment. And you can see my treatment scheme is going to be a treatment on either side. Advance my scope. To the bladder neck. Viru just was off to, the, to, the, to my left side. I'm up to the bladder neck. I'm going to move my scope to the 3 o'clock position once I, okay, confirm my distance. a single treatment in this spot. The idea is maybe this will reduce uh, catheter time and minimize any potential impact on ejaculation. I'm staying away from the apex again uh, to try and spare any impact on ejaculation. One treatment's done. I confirm the nine o'clock position and back I go delivering the final treatment on this less is more prostate. Good enough, no loss of steam on that one. And we're done, going home. So um, an example here, middle lobe, just the middle lobe. This is a large middle lobe. I'm not gonna show you the rest of the prostate treatment, just gonna concentrate on the large middle lobe. You're gonna see two clefts, uh, a cleft on each side of this big protruding intravesical component. This is one of the advantages of the resumed treatment is being able to treat these middle lobes.
I'm scouting that out. There's one deep cleft. I'm going to slip over to the other side. There's the other contralateral deep cleft. And again, my this time my needle is going to come in from lateral to medial off the bladder neck field of view. So I hit it on one side, deliver the steam, and I'm going to move on to the next side off screen. And of course, first here, I would obviously treat uh, some lateral tissue as well, but I'm, I'm not going to belabor the point in this particular case. Again, a field of view off, and I deliver that lateral to medial kind of tangential injection into the middle lobe. Here's All right, terrific. So at this point, I want to hand off to Dr. Kaplan. Uh, thank you again, uh, everyone, for participating and uh, uh, joining us today. Dr. Kaplan. Uh, thank you, Mike, for introducing uh, this uh, video. And I uh, hope you've enjoyed uh, the two videos so far. Uh, they've really been very, very interesting and, and, and learning a lot of techniques, finally. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, aquablation. Uh, my only disclosure is I'm the principal investigator for Eurotronics for the Everest trial, the balloon dilation. So the beauty of doing the aquablation, it's kind of three-dimensional, which is what I kind of like, because you're seeing it from outside in and inside out, because there is a transurethral piece right here and that's where you can visualize the hand piece and then you're doing it under uh, ultrasound. And I will tell you, I have learned as many TORs as I've done, I've done almost 4,000 of them. I have learned, uh, I have learned uh, so much by just um, actually doing them under ultrasound. Uh, you really learn a lot. So here is a, a before picture, it's a patient with trilobar hypertrophy and you can actually see the mapping of the therapy. So we start, um, this is our beginning of treatment. This is the middle lobe here. And then we go to bladder neck, mid prostatic urethra, and then towards the apex. And you all can actually see when the, uh, when the uh, therapy is on, you can actually see the urethra. It, it's really a very interesting therapy and you're always under control. I mean, that's what you, I think that's the major advantage of this. This is a before and this is an after. And you can see, because we don't look at this under ultrasound, it's enormous cavity uh, that, that actually occurs. And that's the beauty of ultrasound. You actually, I, I've gotten to a point where I'm actually delivering the instrument uh, transurethrally under ultrasound guidance. I don't even look with my eyes. I actually just look at the ultrasound because that's how nice it is. So uh, Dean Elterman uh, alluded to this, that initially uh, just the catheter was placed with some traction. And the beauty now is that uh, what, what we've done is cauterize and remove some of this fluffy tissue and, and cauterize the bladder neck. It adds about another extra five to seven minutes per procedure. And the amount of transfusion rate has gone down remarkably. And this is some, uh, some data that's uh, been recently uh, published. So in, in a certain sense, you get a little bit of uh, both. Uh, it's not a full TY you do, just really go around uh, the clock at 12 o'clock just to get the cautery and over 1100 patients across an incredible range of prostates from two to 300 cc's, uh, the transfusion rate was less than 1%. It was dramatically uh, decreased. We've done now 60 and we've uh, transfused one patient. Uh, it was one of our earlier patients. In terms of the outcomes, there's been a host of studies. I won't go through it in the interest of time. Uh, there is the water one study, uh, which was essentially in prostates between 30 and 80 grams. There's also the water two study, which is in patients 80 to 150 grams. And uh, the open water study, which was a prospective multi-center, basically all patients coming in. And this was patients between 20 and 150 cc. So there's a lot of data now to support its use. Um, and I think Mike Lisi talked about that the guidelines talk about uh, to 80, but the bottom line is, is that we are getting more and more experiences um, as we uh, open up their uh, experience with this. In terms of the primary endpoint, it was actually adverse events and uh, it was higher in the uh, TWARP group versus the aquablation group. And the, this is the reduction in symptoms and in the smaller prostates actually uh, was pretty similar between that and, uh, and aquablation. So from a 
from a, a clinical efficacy perspective, they're pretty similar. I think the advantages have really to do with decreased ejaculation and the adverse events. And the major one was uh, retrograde ejaculation because you can actually physically and uh, visually both ult on under, under ultrasound as well as cystoscopic guidance, you can see exactly where you wanna be in terms of avoiding the viral. It's interesting, when, when I was growing up, I was taught to leave the bladder neck intact to preserve ejaculation, that's absolutely not true. You really have to preserve the apex and kind of this butterfly coating of the bladder of, of the vera montanum, and that's what preserves things. So <clears throat> you have control because you're actually looking at things and I think that's important. Uh, and we've learned that continence is actually preserved and you should really always have continence because you're away from the, uh, from the sphincter. Uh, the erectile function shouldn't be affected at all. And ejaculatory uh, function is preserved in the vast majority of patients. And that's what they actually are very interested in. And you can do very large prostates. And again, although there are other techniques that are excellent, HOLEP, um, uh, simple prostatectomy, those are gonna have much higher rates of ret retrograde ejaculation if you remove the entire adenoma. Here, you don't have to remove the entire adenoma, and I think that's the, the major advantage. Okay, so this was something I presented last year, and I, I used a lot of footage from a great colleague, uh, Professor Bach in Hamburg, uh, Germany. I'd like to share this with you. This was a patient who was 59, prostate volume of 70 cc's, very symptomatic and uh, its flow rate was 7.7 .7 with a PSA of 4.7. So there's multiple parts to the system. So we're gonna do the setup first. And this is the key. The first is to insert and position a transrectal ultrasound probe to view the full prostate in both sagittal and transverse. And this is very, very important because it's not the typical torquing that you actually see and do with a biopsy. So we have to remember in terms of how we actually manipulate our hands to get a good view. A handpiece is then inserted. And you can see this here under ultrasound guidance. And you can see the torquing that goes and the angulation of the prostatic urethra. And this is uh, in the sagittal uh, view. And once the handpiece is inserted and you can see the reflection there, you retract the scope towards the viru and you can see on the lower right hand side what that looks like. You can see it moving backwards. The water device remains in the bladder. This is very important in terms of how we map out our treatment. You can see in the upper right-hand corner what this looks like cystoscopically towards the viral, the aspiration tube and the scope tip and the aqua beam nozzle you can see on the ultrasound image. You really wanna optimize that transrectal ultrasound image because that is really the key to treatment in terms of how you plan it. So here you see the scope is retracted and we're ready to rotate and align the transrectal ultrasound. This is, again, part of the alignment. You want to get it medially, so you can see that the uh, transrectal ultrasound is then shifted. There is a guider uh, that you can use as well. You will want to align the water jet to be at both the 3 and 9 o'clock position, and you can see that it's perfect here in terms of where it is. And once everything is set up, we now plan the treatment. So you want to really do the angle planning in the uh, transverse view, and you want to maximize on transrectal ultrasound image the uh, maximal width of the prostate. You can see by retracting the ultrasound, you're seeing that. And there are going to be four points which you can move, and you can move the uh, treatment algorithm around, and there's four points. You want to be within the capsule, and you'll see shortly that this can be aligned and you can move any or all of the, uh, both of the bullet points. And here you want to see that you're inside of the prostatic capsule at its maximum width. You advance, now we go back into the sagittal view and you really map out where you want to treat. So you can see that the, um, the uh, stepper is being moved forward. There is the tip of the nozzle and that gives us a little bit of an angle in terms of where we want to treat. We want to register that first, and then you want to trace it back towards the probe, which was positioned towards the Vera Montana. And this gives you a kind of a straight alignment. You want to be straight aligned in terms of how to treat. 
Then you're going to place the treatment markers, and you'll see a series of them that align. Uh, this is where the treatment starts, and obviously it will change if you have a middle lobe. This patient did not have uh, an impressive middle, middle lobe. There's bladder neck, middle, middle prostate, towards the rear montana, the treatment end. And these can be adjusted as well. So you really want to identify that treatment profile. You want to start at where prostate tissue actually begins, and you can see by using the hand cursor, it can be moved uh, towards where uh, we believe the bladder neck and beginning of the prostate is, and it can be uh, uh, changed and narrowed. Uh, and you want to be, sometimes we'll move uh, this either uh, laterally or up and down. And finally, that yellowish area you see in the area is, to, the concept is to preserve ejaculation. So the depth of penetration of the aquablation therapy is a little bit less there. And we have found that that really is great at preserving ejaculation. So you want to get a nice depth, and this is when you're going to start, and this is when you treat. So the key is to really set it up. The rest of it's step on a button, if you will. So uh, we've aligned now the treatment. And this is the aquablation therapy that's computed for about three minutes. And you can see the impressive amount of tissue that's being removed. And you can see this real time, which is kind of fun. And you're just watching this. Everything is set. It's aligned. We've set this now at four times speed. It's not that fast. Uh, but you can see as you open it up how wide the prostatic channel actually is. It's, it's really impressive uh, how much tissue is actually removed very, very quickly. And um, in this case, it's about three minutes of treatment. And as you see, it's getting closer towards the distal part of the prostate. There's going to be a little bit of a uh, change in terms of the depth of penetration. That's on purpose. Because again, the idea is to preserve ejaculation. And you can see the depth of penetration of the aquablation. And remember the tissue that was there before? And look how now it's basically been ablated. So when we get close to uh, towards the viru, uh, basically there's a left apical cut and a right apical cut. So both sides are done uh, separately. And that's part of the original treatment plan. And you can even adjust depth of penetration even at this point. But what is very, very clear in ultrasound is how quickly uh, the tissue is removed. And you can see that the uh, apical jet uh, going back and forth in the upper right-hand corner on cystoscopy. At this point, the handpiece is removed. And you can see just how much of a space you actually have. It's really quite impressive. Uh, that, that's all open channel, that wide area. And you can see how much tissue is actually uh, ablated. I tend to leave the uh, transrectal ultrasound probe in, as I'll show you in a couple of minutes why. So in this case, the total treatment time was uh, 15 minutes. And then uh, a catheter is placed. And this has evolved as well about the type of catheter and how much tension is placed. But here you can see a catheter with the balloon at the bladder neck and placed on an appropriate amount of uh, tension. And um, again, that's really more up to you and your own practices in terms of the uh, catheter that you actually use. Now, I'm going to focus on bladder neck cauterization. I wanted to thank the video from uh, uh, my colleague. And this is what I do at the end of the case. And I have chosen to do particularly larger prostates. Um, and at the end of the procedure, with a transrectal ultrasound probe in, I actually go in with a bipolar electrode and uh, cauterize. So you can see, uh, first I aspirate the tissue, uh, and you can see the color of the uh, irrigant. Um, this is actually available for prostatic. That sludge can be examined under uh, pathologic examination. So using a loop, uh, you just cauterize and remove tissue at the bladder neck, that slough, if you will, uh, that uh, fluffy tissue, and remove it, and then buzz the bladder neck. And I do this circumferentially. I don't like to use a vapor, a, um, a button, because the depth of penetration is not really what you want. You want to actually remove that tissue and actually cauterize it. And it's really impressive once you do that, because the bleeding is all going to be at the bladder neck. You don't have to go that deep. You just remove that slough, uh, fluffy tissue and cauterize. And you can see if you do that all around, and I do this uh, literally right around the clock at the bladder neck. And that's where all the bleeding is going to be anyway, because the other tissue that's uh, more distal is actually just uh, not going to really bleed. And here we're doing it at the top of the uh, bladder, uh, bladder neck again, very minimal bleeding. It's usually at the bottom. Uh, and again, I prefer to use the loop because I find that much more useful 
and efficacious in terms of uh, the degree of control of bleeding. And that tissue can be removed as well. You can see how dry it is from when it started. You don't have to keep digging and digging. You just take off that uh, fluffy tissue and then you just uh, coagulate it. And in this case, we like to use the bipolar uh, loop. We found it to be very, very effective. And we do that until we're comfortable that it's uh, actually dry. And you can see here from the irrigation, uh, how much drier it actually is. It's almost clear. And then we put a catheter in and put it under uh, three-way. And this has allowed us to uh, send patients home the same day. Um, and uh, we usually be able to take the catheter out depending on the clinical condition uh, the, next, uh, the next day. So it's really been quite impressive. And you can see here the difference in drainage. And this has been our experience as well. So that's a key maneuver in terms of being able to uh, expedite this. And if you look at the transfusion results with this bladder neck cautery uh, from 2019 and 2020, if you look at new, new uh, cases and experienced cases, the overall transfusion rate, if you can look at the bottom right-hand corner, is about 0.5%. I hope you uh, enjoyed that video. And I'm gonna turn now to Dr. Elterman, who will uh, show data on the uh, temporary implantable night null device for BPH. Dean? Thanks very much, uh, Steve. I'm going to start my slide. So uh, this is the temporary implantable night null device or ITIND, and this is the newest of the four uh, novel BPH technologies. And so it may not be very familiar. I'm gonna spend a bit of time uh, going through um, how the device works. Those are my disclosures. So in terms of uh, what this is, this is a temporarily implanted device. It's left inside you for about five to seven days. The result are these deep bloodless incisions created through ischemic pressure and subsequent necrosis. And the result is permanent remodeling of the prostatic urethra and bladder neck. And as I mentioned, uh, it's very new. Uh, in terms of its availability in the United States, it received FDA approval in March of 2020. So a little bit more in terms of the, the details of the device. Uh, the, I'm gonna go back. The uh, iTIND is a single use device. Uh, it has a dedicated delivery system, which is essentially a small sheet that you can pass through, either a flexible uh, or rigid scope. Uh, we'll talk about that. And essentially it has three nitinol cutting struts. Uh, one is at the 12 o'clock position, and then there are two more at five and seven o'clock. It's about five centimeters in length and three and a half centimeters in height. Uh, you'll also notice on the inferior aspect is what we call the anchoring leaflet at six o'clock. And what this does is it prevents the device from migrating either forward or back. And as you pull the device back, that anchoring leaflet is gonna pull over the top of the bladder neck or middle lobe and sit just uh, in the base between the viru and that uh, bladder neck. You'll also notice that there is a retrieval suture which is anchored to the distal part of the device and this is for easy uh, removal. And so when it is in situ for the five or seven days, what we typically do is we'll leave a bit of length of that retrieval suture and then we will coil it and stick it back onto the dorsum of the, the penis on the shaft and I actually just use a Band-Aid to keep it intact. Uh, and you do want to leave a bit of room so it doesn't pull it or if they get a nocturnal erection. And so uh, essentially then the mechanism of action is that the device is uh, inserted into the bladder where it expands. And then you orient it so that the five, uh, seven o'clock position and 12 o'clock uh, cutting struts are in the right orientation. And then you very gently under direct cystoscopic visualization will pull it back into the prostatic fossa. And so it'll essentially engage into the bladder neck and to the prostate. It's then left in situ, as I mentioned, for five to seven days, and then it's removed. And the removal I'm gonna show you in the video is quite simple in the in-office procedure, where you'll backload the retrieval sheath through a special open-ended catheter. And essentially it pulls and it collapses backwards like an umbrella. Um, once this uh, device has been in for five to seven days, essentially it is effectively cutting through the tissue and opening the bladder outlet and relieves the obstruction. After the five to seven days, the device is no longer required. And it, as I mentioned, it is entirely removed. There are no uh, foreign bodies left in the patient. Now, unlike dilation of the tissue or say a transurethral incision of the bladder neck where the tissue is torn or it's a traumatic incision, 
This gradual ischemic effect of the itin does not cause any bleeding. And it's really this effect that allows the openings and the reshaping of the prostate uh, to stay as it is. And so uh, it does serve, unlike a prostatic stent, which is a scaffold, these ischemic uh, incisions are actually permanent. And therefore the device, as I mentioned, is no longer left in situ. And you can see from these post removal pictures, these actual deep grooves at the seven, five and 12 o'clock position. There are uh, a number of clinical trials, prospective studies that have now been established. Uh, these are uh, three or four of the clinical trials in a number of patients. And essentially we're seeing very similar results to the other minimally invasive surgical therapies that have been mentioned in the past, Urolift and Resume. So you're seeing IPSS reductions between 45 to 60%, maximum flow rates improving anywhere from 50% to 100%. The longest study carried out to 36 months shows a very low reintervention rate of less than 9%. Uh, of course, uh, as I mentioned, the device is left in situ, but there is no catheter required after the procedure. So it's the device alone with no catheter. In all of the studies, we've been able to demonstrate uh, preservation of erectile and ejaculatory function. Uh, it has uh, essentially the lowest rate of adverse events compared to the other minimally invasive therapies. And there are no late occurring adverse events because the device is entirely removed. So I'm gonna take you through a few of the clinical trials. Uh, I'm gonna speed up through this first part and then spend a bit of time on the most recent ones. This was actually the first device, which was the TIND, not the ITIND. Uh, and the device uh, design has actually changed, but this was just uh, proof of concept. 32 Italian patients treated with this uh, slightly different four-strutted device. Uh, and again, it showed improvements in IPSS all the way out to three years, as well as improvements in maximum flow rates. Um, it was very well tolerated with very few adverse events and no reported changes in uh, erectile or ejaculatory function. Uh, subsequent to this, uh, the ITIND or the second generation device, which is the one that is currently available around the world through Olympus, uh, was designed and this was the second or pivotal or main study for the MTO2. This was a multi-center prospective single arm study conducted uh, mostly in Europe. It was 81 patients uh, with a mean prostate volume of about 30, 40 mils. And again, this is the contemporary commercially available device. And you can see this uh, cohort has now been followed out for two years or 24 months. And we see an IPSS symptom improvement of around 60. Uh, so essentially you're dropping from a score of baseline around 22 which is where most of the other pivotal studies for the other devices have started. And you see a reduction down to about an IPSS of eight and a half or nine. We do see improvements in the maximum flow rate as well as a significant improvement in quality of life uh, and some improvements in post void residual. In terms of adverse events, you see that the uh, adverse event rates are essentially in the single digits uh, with uh, retention, UTI, dysuria, UT, uh, urgency, pain, hematuria. Very typical, again, what you would see in the other minimally invasive devices. And they're again, self-limited and self-resolving uh, quite quickly. And re remember the device is going to be removed after uh, five to seven days. This was a subsequent study, uh, which is actually still ongoing. This is a prospective single arm multi-center European study, uh, as well as a, a site in Australia. Uh, they are trying to include up to 200 patients uh, with a, a prostate size a little bit bigger, around 62 uh, mil, uh, sorry, average age of 61, average prostate volume closer to 40 mils. And these are some of the interim results, still quite preliminary, but again, we're seeing very similar improvements in IPSS, maximum flow rate, and quality of life. And again, we see the same uh, safety parameters with no deterioration in sexual function, as is demonstrated in the uh, SHIM and IIEF. So the pivotal study, uh, which was uh, recently published in the Gold Journal, um, I published this with uh, Dr. Chugtai from Cornell, uh, and this was the multi-center randomized controlled study, uh, which was essentially uh, given to the FDA for approval of this device. Uh, this was a randomized study to sham, uh, a two-to-one randomization, 
And essentially these patients were then followed out uh, to initially 12 months. And then of course there is an extension to the study. There were no significant differences as you look at the p-values between the ITIND and the sham arms with respect to age, uh, BMI, prostate size was around 43, uh, IPSS score was around 22, maximum flow rates were around eight and a half milliliters per second with residuals PVRs around 60, so under 100 mils. Uh, and you can see here quality of life, people were fairly dissatisfied around four and a half to five on the uh, quality of life uh, IPSS question. So I'll draw your attention to the red boxes. I know there's a lot of information here, but essentially the takeaway at 12 months is that there was a statistically significant improvement in the IPSS from a baseline of 21 down to about 12. So a nine, uh, over nine point reduction. We also see a significant almost two point improvement in the IPSS quality of life. We see also a statistically significant improvement in the maximum flow rate. There was no significant difference in post void residual as well as no changes in the SHIM or IIEF indicating no erectile or ejaculatory dysfunction. In terms of adverse events, they were uh, essentially far and few between. Again, typically single digits. Dysuria uh, in about a quarter of patients with hematuria around 14%. Uh, and then again, the single digits that we would see with any of the minimally invasive therapies, but in fact, lower rates when you compare to the uh, resume and Eurolift data. And again, self-limited to uh, essentially the first um, month. So I'm gonna begin with a uh, short animation followed by a video of a case. ITIND is a safe, quick, and minimally invasive procedure for the treatment of benign prostatic hyperplasia by using a temporarily implanted cutting device. First, a rigid cystoscope is inserted into the metis and guided up the urethra until it passes the bladder neck. The ITIN device is inserted into the sheath in a crimped configuration and pushed through until it is released into the bladder. The cystoscope sheath is withdrawn, the optics are reinserted and the cystoscope sheath and optics are guided back in parallel to the ITIN delivery system for visualisation. The ITIN device is manipulated to bring the anchoring leaflet into the 6 o'clock position and distal to the bladder neck. The cystoscope is removed. The guide wire is cut at its proximal end and removed, exposing the retrieval suture and leaving the ITIN in place, where it will remain for only 5 to 7 days. During this time, the three cutting struts of the ITIN device expand and exert pressure on the prostatic urethra and bladder neck. This gradual and continuous pressure creates three deep longitudinal incisions through ischemia and necrosis at 12, 5 and 7 o'clock. After five to seven days, the ITIN device is removed. First, the retrieval suture is threaded through an open-ended silicon Foley catheter. The catheter is advanced until it meets the ITIN. Once reaching the device, the retrieval suture is pulled taut and the ITIN device is easily collapsed into the catheter and removed through the urethra. Once the device is removed, deep incisions and an open pathway through the prostatic urethra can be observed. The procedure is now finished. So these procedures uh, can be done under some uh, local uh, intravenous uh, conscious sedation, local anesthetic. There's also an option as well of using a rigid scope or uh, a flexible cystoscope. No additional uh, special equipment is required. You begin the case by uh, performing a cystoscopy, uh, gently coming through the urethra and coming over the bladder neck um, to ensure that the scope is introduced in an atraumatic fashion. And once you're inside the bladder, you will remove the uh, telescope, leaving the outer sheath in place, and you will prepare the eye tend. The eye tend has a outer 
uh, sheath, which will keep it uh, closed. And you can advance it through the introducer sheath uh, by pressure until the device is pushed all the way through the end of the scope and is released into the bladder. At this point, you will feel almost an opening or a pop, and you can remove the introducer sheath. At this point, you can actually remove the cystoscopic sheath while keeping the eye tinned and its uh, attachment string. At this point, you'll put together your scope once again and pass it alongside the uh, eye tinned device back into the bladder. This will allow you to have the freedom of movement to twist and rotate the eye tinned device to place it properly within the prostate. So you can see here now the struts positioned and what you want to try and do is maneuver the eye tinned under direct vision such that the anchoring leaflet which looks like a semicircular tongue there is at six o'clock and the struts are at 12, five and seven. Under direct vision, you will very slowly pull the eye tin device back such that the anchoring leaflet passes over the bladder neck very gently. Once it passes over the bladder neck, you want to place the anchoring leaflet so it sits just at the base of the median lobe or bladder neck just in front of the vera montanum. When you remove the device, the external sphincter should completely close around and your scope is then removed. At the end of the ITIN device is a string. You can cut the knot, leaving the, uh, the string in place. This is called the retrieval suture. You can merely wind it up and place it uh, on the dorsum of the penis using a piece of tape or a Band-Aid. And of course, you want to leave a bit of extra string to allow for some give for nocturnal erections. You can loosely fasten the suture and leave it in place. The ITIN device is now left in for five to seven days, and then it can be retrieved. In this video, you can see the patient here receiving some light sedation. In my practice, we've done this just with local anesthetic with xylocaine gel. You will prepare the uh, catheter as well as the retrieval uh, suture and a snare. The snare is a um, metal string that will be placed through the lubricated Foley catheter with the end cut off of, of the catheter. The snare will go through and actually be able to hook on or tie to the retrieval suture. That way, you'll be able to pull it back out through the Foley catheter. I typically use a 22 French catheter with the end cut off or a specially designed catheter with no end so that it's blunt. It's very helpful to have an assistant or a second pair of hands available to hold the retrieval string and snare. Again, you'll place another xylocaine gel into the urethra and very simply with a little bit of traction, hold that retrieval snare taut and then you will advance as you normally would the Foley catheter until the hub of the catheter meets the hub of the ITIN device. You will feel them engage and at this point, you can retract and pull back on that snare. The ITIN device will uh, close backwards like an umbrella, and it can be pulled out entirely with the catheter. This is a cystoscopic view showing the bladder neck and prostate after the ITIN has been removed. You can see that the temporary implantable nitinol device creates three channels to allow for improved flow. The reshaping of the prosthetic urethra occurs at the 12 o'clock position as well as at the five and seven o'clock positions. Unlike a TUIP, these are slow, gradual incisions created over five days through ischemic necrosis and pressure. Thus, they will not close up and heal as you would see with a, an incision, which is much more traumatic. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank everyone and uh, look forward to seeing everyone in Las Vegas at the AUA. We'll be presenting an updated uh, technique of the ITIN using a flexible scope. And with that, I'll hand it back to Steve for the Q&A. Thank you. Uh, and again, thank you to, uh, to Mike and Brian and Dean for their videos. Um, it's 8.58, so we'll go to about 9.05 because I'll just uh, we had a lot of questions and I don't think we're going to have a chance to go through all of it. And then we'll do our poll questions and then I'll turn it back to Kaylee.
So just a couple of questions about how ultrasounds are done, ultrasound measurements. Uh, in the guidelines, we talk about the transrectal, transabdominal is probably okay as well. I think it's whatever you have access to. Uh, pressure flow studies, I think each of us will have our own way of doing it. So I trained with pressure flow studies, but uh, I'm just quickly around the loop, Brian, pressure flow before a procedure. Certainly not routinely. Um, I think occasionally on very equivocal situations, sometimes also because I may want the information for patient counseling for expectations, um, but it is not any routine part of my BPH pathway. Okay. Dean? Yeah, it's not typical. I think if you have a query around whether someone in retention has detrusor underactivity or any tonic bladder and it's worthwhile to even intervene, you might want to see what they're you know, do some urodynamics, but generally I think a uroflowmetry and a post void are sufficient. Okay, Mike, any other comments? No, great. I, I reiterate both of what they say. Okay, and then again, we're around the loop, if either a urolift or a zoom fail, can you do a another one or two ship, go from a urolift to a zoom or a zoom to a urolift? And can you do some type of uh, laser TUR afterwards? So Mike, if you fail, uh, let's say a zoom, uh, can you do a urolift and or surgery? So uh, I would actually say the other way around. If, if you fail a urolift to try to do a resume, I, I wouldn't recommend it, uh, mainly because what you're doing then is you're going to create atrophy in the prostate tissue, and then suddenly the, the uh, clips are going to be exposed. We've actually had several cases now of patients that are having sort of these, these clips that kind of uh, meander and end up in places that they shouldn't. Uh, on the mm -hmm. other hand, a resume and followed by a urolift is probably okay. Uh, we've done several of those now as well. Those seem to be successful. Uh, even urolift followed by another urolift, those patients uh, also do very well as well. Uh, and, and resume followed by resume has also been done. And we've also had success in that arena as well. Okay, hey, Dean. I think you have the same conversation in terms of the decision making with the patient each time. You know, some people were really fixated on the one first choice and they want it again. Others are willing to change tack and go uh, to something else. But I don't have a, a rule necessarily about one following the other. I think all options are generally on the table. Okay. Finally, Brian. Yeah, Mike, we have a great um, summary that uh, I think all of these things are generally options generally after the other ones. Uh, I think that patients tend to fall into one of two categories, as Dean alluded to, which is if they have, quote, failed a minimally invasive therapy, some of those are going to want to still maintain their sexual function, and so they're not going to agree to move on with the surgical therapy. Others of those are going to conclude, well, I failed minimally invasive, and so I specifically want surgical therapy, and, and so it becomes a conversation question. Okay, finally, one last point that I'll make. If you're going to do a bipolar electrovaporization type of procedure after a year lift, use the thicker loop because the thin loops can break easily. So use the thicker loop. So let's now turn, uh, Kayla, if you can put the questions back up. Uh, this is a post assessment. So before I'm handing it back off to Kaylee, I wanted to thank everyone for participating, my outstanding faculty, uh, and they're really great videos, and I really appreciated uh, talking to them and their interplay. And most of all, to you for listening and to staying with us. Uh, there's a lot more information coming out. I hope uh, to see many of you in Las Vegas at the AOA meeting and, uh, and join us as uh, the data evolves. So uh, good evening, and let me turn it back to Kaylee for final conclusions.